In this presentation tier of videos, we'll begin to think like an amateur physician. It's important to be able to recognize signs and symptoms, presentations, of certain ailments when a patient comes to the doctor's office or hospital. Detecting which illness a patient has is a vital skill to develop for the boards as well. This tier will act as a quick review and further elaborate on some of the aspects we discussed in the previous video. Sometimes it helps if you relate the presentation to a patient you may have seen or have experience with. If you don't have much experience with patients, try to think of a family member or friend that was last sick with similar signs and symptoms. If you've been taking written notes or screenshots up to this point, good, we encourage you to take notes during these lecture series. But now, put them away. No cheating. We want you to try to guess what disease is being presented. There are quite a few pathologies related to Staph aureus. Can you remember which ones are associated with this bacteria? How about if a patient comes in with a presentation of cellulitis, skin inflammation, and disquamation with possible Nikolsky sign? There are actually two possibilities for this. This patient's history is going to help with the early diagnosis of either toxic shock syndrome or staph scalded skin syndrome. TSS is associated with fever, hypotension, and often female menstrual cycles due to prolonged tampon use. That's a classic vignette question for this disease. Toxic shock syndrome toxin, TSS toxin, is responsible for the majority of TSS cases, although there are a few other toxins that can cause it in rare instances. Staph scolded skin syndrome is more commonly associated with child infections and it has a positive Nikolsky sign, while TSS is Nikolsky negative. Both on the boards and in the wards, you'll be able to easily separate these diseases based on the patient history and demographics. Next, we have a child with fever and crusty nose discharge. Hopefully you're thinking of impetigo and recalling that this may be seen in one of the strep microbes as well. What about unilateral leg pain leading to sepsis? This may seem a little vague, but imagine a patient has a healing wound over the side of the leg pain. The wound doesn't appear infected and the skin appears to be healing well. What would you now think of? Well, the only bone disease we've covered so far is osteomyelitis, which can be spread hematogenously as well. So maybe this is from the patient's wound that appears to be healing and it was inoculated prior to healing, or maybe it was spread from somewhere else. We don't have enough to go on yet to decide. What about a murmur, history of IV drug use, and joint pain? I'm sure you were thinking the murmur must be related to heart disease. Of course, this is one of our pathogens that cause endocarditis. How many others can you remember that cause endocarditis? Shortness of breath, cough, excessive mucus production, and throat pain. This is most likely a possible tracheitis culprit. Staph doesn't have to travel all that far from the nose to get to that area. Red, warm, and erythematous skin. Here's another hint. It's not a superficial disease that we already discussed above. This one is the deeper tissue that is inflamed, called cellulitis. Lastly, we are given an x-ray with lobular infiltrates, possible lung effusions, and a pneumatoseal. Remember that it's common to be given terms on exams that you may not have previously heard, or a different word in place of a common term. Hopefully the rest of the clues can lead you to the correct answer, even though you were not previously given pneumatoseal as a term for this disease. Here's a critical thinking moment. If Staph aureus is found on and around the epidermal surfaces, can it lead to otitis media? Staph epi is a pretty easy pathogen to remember. There's only one main disease that we needed to remember here. Can you recall what it is? What if I say the patient displays left-sided heart vegetations and valve abnormalities? With the numerous endocarditis pathogens we covered, I'm hoping this particular heart disease is beginning to stand out. Do you remember the three layers of the heart wall? What gender is more likely to suffer from an infection of staph sapro? What if I said the patient suffers from urinary frequency and discomfort? Female patients are much more likely to suffer from UTI due to anatomical differences by gender. Also note that this patient is afebrile. If the infection spread up to the kidney and caused pyelonephritis, we would more likely see a fever, as well as other symptoms. If you recall the many disease states of staph aureus infections, this one should be much easier. 
Take a second to name off as many strep pyogenes diseases as you can. Now which diseases are more specific to strep that are not seen in staph? How about if a child with a strawberry tongue, sandpaper skin, and pastillas lines shows to the office? This last one wasn't mentioned, but the first two should be a dead giveaway. The patient presents with scarlet fever. Pastillas lines are petechial lines seen in the anticubital fossa. The Jones criteria. We didn't mention the Jones criteria in the last video, so don't worry if you haven't heard of this. The Jones criteria is a mnemonic for joints, carditis, nodules, erythema marginatum, and Sydenham's chorea. These are all secondary symptoms and diseases that can be seen in patients with scarlet fever, helping to pinpoint this diagnosis. Please watch the videos in our recommended resources list for more details on the sequelae of this disease. How about crusted nasal discharge? It should make you remember the important superficial skin infection, impetigo. The patient has dark urine with hypertension and periorbital edema. The dark urine can usually mean one of two things, kidney disease or hepatobiliary disease. An important manifestation of strep, even if treated with antibiotics, is post-strep glomerular nephritis. This can progress to rapidly progressing glomerular nephritis, which is a severe and permanent damage of the kidney. We don't get more general than flu-like symptoms and sore throat. Luckily, both medical and non-medical personnel should be familiar with the strep throat pharyngitis. Lastly, the patient has obsessive actions and a tic disorder. The history of strep leads us to think of the one cognitive related disease we discussed in the previous tier, pandas. Ticks can be physical or verbal actions that are out of the individual's control. The image on the right is a histological stain, a slice of the kidney tissue only a few cells wide that is stained with dyes and placed under a microscope. Specifically, this is the glomerulus, the basic filtering component of the kidney. If the heart is due to an HS2 or hypersensitivity 2 reaction, then the kidney damage must be caused by HS3. What mechanism of action is the reaction caused by? Strep agalactiae was a special pathogen in the list of bacteria covered in the previous video. Do you remember which demographic is most likely to succumb to this bacteria? What if I said it's related to pregnancy? One presentation we might see is a febrile, irritable patient with bulging fontanelles. We should consider meningitis in any newborn with bulging fontanelles and fever. Group B strep is a very lethal bacterium to neonates and prophylactic antibiotics should be given in any infected mother. If you're a medical student, you'll most likely have to perform the group B strep test while doing your OBGYN rotation. How about respiratory problems and neutrocytosis? The other common disease to be wary of in group B strep is pneumonia and sepsis. Now, when you hear a crackling cough of a patient, the first thought in your head should be strep pneumonia. The presentation will likely be something like shortness of breath, respiratory issues, and cough. Of course, we have to think of the disease state. It's in the name of the organism. This one's pretty easy, pneumonia. No matter what demographic of the ill individual, Strep pneumo is always the most likely cause of pneumonia. However, we'll see in later modules that certain demographics are also likely to have pneumonia caused by age-specific and immunity state-specific pathogens. Pneumonia is an easy one to associate to this bug, but what were the other two main diseases that we discussed previously? What if the patient presents with photophobia, possible seizures, neck stiffness, and tachycardia? Bacterial meningitis is no joke. It is a very lethal manifestation even with modern medicine. Anytime the brain and its protective covering gets infected, immediate intervention must be taken. This is no take two pills and call me in the morning. It's time to hospitalize, treat, and begin testing to make sure the correct microbe is identified and treated for. Ear pain with bulging tympanic membrane. Pediatric patients with ear pain or an infant tugging on one of their ears or both should make you think of otitis media. Severe infections can even lead to the membrane perforating. What do fistfights, floss, and dentists all have in common? They provoke viridin strep. What type of tissue would you think is infected if the patient presents with 
cardiac murmurs, generalized flu-like symptoms, and a history of dental procedures. Here again we see our favorite heart disease with endocarditis. Here's one that wasn't covered. How can viridin strep lead to a brain abscess? Sinus infections or dental procedures can lead to a contiguous spread, in severe cases even causing osteomyelitis of the skull. Remember, just because only Staph aureus and Strep pyogenes are listed for skin, tissue, bone diseases, doesn't mean that it's limited to them. These lists are not exhaustive. It is just overwhelmingly more common in those microbes. But given the right circumstances, such as bleeding gums, you may want to consider other bugs as well. And last, the enterics. Where can gut bacteria go? Well, pretty much anywhere. If their comfy colon home is disrupted by a penetrating object or rough neighbors moving in, they may grow out of control and spread. A patient presents with muscle pain, shortness of breath, and leg edema, what would you think? Again, we have to consider endocarditis. The later stages of heart disease, the outflow of blood can be decreased, leading to backup of fluids into the tissues. Pelvic pain, diarrhea, painful urination, and abdominal cramping. This is actually a combination of signs and symptoms from two disease states, so I kind of cheated here. But with a name like enterococcus, you shouldn't need much reminding that it's going to affect the gastrointestinal system. What would you typically see in a patient with severe gastroenteritis? How efficient do you think the intestines are if they're inflamed? Hopefully this relatively quick review helped to solidify some of the common signs and symptoms of infections with gram-positive cocci. They are probably one of the easiest groups of bacteria to memorize and have a lot of similarities in disease states as you've seen. But how do we know of the many bacteria named so far is causing the endocarditis? When do we determine to treat staph versus strep skin infections? In the next video, we'll cover the lab tests used to distinguish between these pathogens and some of their unique characteristics. Also, make sure to keep up with the following modules where we'll cover gram-positive rods, gram-negative bacteria, and some other strange ones that don't clearly fit into these two categories. If you appreciate the material we are creating, the best form of flattery is sharing it with your friends. If you haven't done so, please subscribe to our YouTube page, like us on Facebook, and bookmark our website as we continue to create and gather more resources for your use. Also, join our mailing list to be notified when our new course material is released. We'd also appreciate any feedback you might have to improve on future material and direct the concentration of future content.